Thank you, David. Let's pray, shall we? That the Lord would bless his word to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which we have just heard read. And uh, we pray that as we open this together now, that your spirit would open our hearts and open the scriptures to us and open our eyes so that we see wonderful things in your law. Father, we've read here that your, your word is pure. The words, of the, Lord's are, Lord, the words of the Lord are pure words. And so, Father, we pray that we would delight in these pure words that we look at together this evening. We pray that we would treasure the pure words that speak of Christ. And uh, defend ourselves from the vileness that we see in this psalm as well. The vileness that is all around us. Heavenly Father, we pray then that you would bless us this evening. And uh, uh, cause us to discern what is from you and anything that is from you this evening. We pray that that would remain with us and be a blessing for us. Uh, in the days that lie ahead. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 12, please do have it open if you would. It's on page 452. Do you ever feel surrounded by evil? Do you ever feel the faithful are so few? Now I don't mean from the perspective of pride. I don't mean from the point of view of self-righteousness. It is very easy and possible to lament the world in pride as though from a perch looking down on the world. But that's not what I mean. A believer can grieve these things in humility because as believers, those who trust in Christ, we know the darkness is in us as well, not just out there. We hunger and thirst for righteousness within us, in our souls, not just in the world. And so do you ever, from a standpoint of knowing that you need God's mercy for your own sin, do you grieve the prevalence of the evil that's all around us and the scarcity of the godly? If so, you will find sympathy in this psalm that we're looking at this evening, Psalm 12. Look at the beginning and end of it. Verse 1, Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone, for the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Uh, verse 8, on every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of man. The wicked, which it talks about there in verse 8, the wicked in the book of Psalms are those who live without any professional sense of submission to God, without any sense of repentance uh, from sin and, and towards Christ. We see that at the end of Psalm 2. Do you remember those two gateway Psalms at the beginning? Sentinel Psalms, basically telling us who can enjoy the words that will come up in the later Psalms. Well, it's those who take refuge in the Son of God, Psalm 2 verse 12. And so the Psalm begins by grieving the scarcity of those who love God and his ways and ends with lamenting the vileness that is practiced and promoted openly and without any sense of restraint very often by unbelievers. Now, the psalm has a glorious note of hope in the middle, in verses 5 to 7, which we'll come on to. But do you see how this hope that's in the middle is surrounded on either side, before and after, with this sense of the dire situation that the psalmist is living in? And we can sympathize with that, can't we? Do you see the very structure of the psalm illustrates its own theme? Vileness all around. Vileness to begin with, vileness at the end. And so the psalm begins and ends so downbeat to convey this sense of being hemmed in on all sides by vileness and the scarcity of the godly. There is a lot of evil around, isn't there? We can totally relate to this, can't we? There's violence on the news. There's Christians cancelled, as I mentioned in my prayer, a Christian artist last week. Lost her exhibition, lost, lost a lot of things. What else is there? Well, the unborn are destroyed on an industrial scale throughout the West. God's ways are flouted, especially with regard to male and female. You don't need me to tell you that, do you? The intersectional pride flag flies, doesn't it? On businesses and on civic buildings. 
wonder if it will fly from the town hall again this year, as it did throughout June and beyond some time back. Now, maybe some of these things particularly trouble you, and you feel powerless and distressed at so much rampant wickedness. Well, the first thing to note is that our psalm is about the very same thing. It's about feeling hemmed in by evil. And so it is helpful, just from that point of view, to know that we are not the first to feel this way. We are not the first to feel hemmed in by the prevalence of evil around us. There's nothing new under the sun. We are not in a unique generation. We are not in an unprecedented situation. Unprecedented, is used a, uh, that, that word is used a lot these days, but, but it, it's just not true. We're not in an unprecedented situation in, in a basic sense, in a fundamental sense. The details of our present day world, yes, they may be new, but the underlying situation is not. The wicked have prowled, as it says in verse 8, throughout the history of the world since the fall, since Genesis 3. The vileness that the world exalts has always been the environment in which the church exists and lives. Now the church needs to be ever vigilant not to absorb the world's ways, which are always a threat to guard against. And of course, that was the big failure of God's people in the Old Testament, that they absorbed the ways of the nations around them. But the encouragement of our psalm is that that the good news is, of God's word, is that the, the darkness is passing. Yes, yes, we do live amongst vileness and, and, and evil all around us, and of course, in, within us, as, as I said earlier. But the good news, John 1 verse so 1 John 2 verse 8 says that the darkness is passing away, the true light is already shining. That is a great verse to hold on to when we think about these sort of things. The darkness that we see all around us is passing. It's, it's a fad, if you like. It's just fading away. It's withering. It's not here permanently. The true light is, the true light is Christ, risen, risen from the dead, which we're praising him for on Easter Sunday morning, aren't we, next week? The true light is already shining. The darkness is not going to last. That's a great thing to hold on to. The Lord Jesus will build his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matthew 16, verse 18. Now David himself, who's the psalmist, you see that in the title, a psalm of David, David himself reaches a point of assurance in this psalm. Look at the contrast between verses 1 and verse 7. Verse 1, Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone. The faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Verse 7, you, O Lord, will keep them. Who? The godly. You will keep them. You will guard us, or guard him from this generation forever. So you see in verse 1, the psalmist David has an overwhelming sense that the godly have gone. There's, there's no one left. He feels like Elijah. I'm the only one left. Whereas in verse 7, David has a calm assurance that the Lord will keep, his, keep the godly. Now, some have puzzled over him and them in verse 7. Uh, you'll see that uh, the word us in verse 7. There's a footnote there that, um, which takes us to the bottom of the page, and it tells us that him is maybe what it is. Some have puzzled over this, but that per perfectly matches the godly and the faithful in verse 1. In verse 1, the godly is singular, the faithful are plural, and so we have him and them to match them in verse 7. The very people that David fretted about, that they were disappearing from the face of the earth, David is assured that they are not in verse 7. Now, what's caused David to have this change of perspective? And the answer is, that it's the good news of verses 5 and 6. It's the word that the Lord speaks that causes David his change of outlook. This is the balm that comforts David and restores his soul after his wobble of verse 1. David's outward circumstances haven't changed. We see that in verse 8. The vileness is still exalted. He's still living in the same situation. But David has changed. His perspective has changed. His view on life has changed. And this, wants, this points us to what will comfort and restore us if and when we wobble as well. Verse 6 is the heart of the psalm. It's David's key discovery, and it's the key teaching of the psalm. In verse 5, David heard the Lord speak to him. And so we have in quotation marks, and it says, says the Lord. 
That's what David heard speak to him. Now, we don't know how David heard that, but that's not particularly uh, relevant for us to consider or to, or to worry about, in a sense. We read in Acts 2, verse 30, that David was a prophet. So, so how the Lord spoke to him, we, we don't know, but that's not for us to dig into. We just know that the Lord did speak to David in a very direct way. So however David heard God speak to him, we are not going to hear the same way because we're not prophets like David was. We hear God speak to us through his inscripturated word, the Bible, the Old and New Testaments. Now, do you see the pattern of this psalm? Verse 1, David prays and pours out his heart to God at the circumstances he feels pressing in on him. Then, verse 5, the Lord speaks to him. And by this, verse 7, David is refreshed and renewed and built up. So for this, this translates for us into pray and seek refreshing and help and blessing where? From the Bible, from God's word. Now God does sometimes put thoughts into our mind as we pray. Maybe you've experienced this. Uh, You've been praying about something and the Lord puts a, a a thought in your mind, and it turns out to be something very helpful and very relevant. The the Lord does do that sometimes, but we shouldn't necessarily expect that, and and all such thoughts need to be tested by the Scriptures. For us, we should not seek God's Word in those things, but in the Bible, in the black and white on the the page. You see, we are not Old Testament prophets like David was. We're not New Testament apostles. There are no more Old Testament prophets. There are no more New Testament prophets apostles because we have what we need in the Bible. We have the prophets and the apostles' words in the Bible. And so that's what we need. The Bible's complete. The canon is closed. We have all that we need there now. This is God's word for us. And isn't it actually the common experience of believers that it's above all the words of the Bible that refresh and restore us and comfort us and are balm to our souls and soothe us? And so this psalm, that as it were, draws alongside us in sympathy at the disturbance we feel about the world around us, points us to God's word, the Bible, and prayerfully reading it as what we need. Let's look at verse 6 then, this key verse. The key summary of David's experience in this whole situation that the psalm recounts. Verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver, refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. This is David's testimony about the word that he's just heard from the Lord in verse 5. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. This, This verse stresses one thing three times, which is that God's words are pure Pure. What does pure mean? What does pure signify? It means useful. It means beneficial. It means life imparting, health giving, soul restoring. Just as impure means useless or worse, destructive, toxic, and so on. And so, in everyday life, we wash and cook what we eat in order to get rid of the dirt and the bugs, don't we? So that it's pure and useful and beneficial for us. We take notes of hygiene ratings when we go out, don't we? Are they nearer the five end or the one end? We're keen if it's the five, aren't we? Because we want pure food. In healthcare, we use sterile dressings, don't we? A surgeon uses sterilized instruments. You might use a water filter to drink from. Computers keep themselves clean from viruses with software that's dedicated for that purpose. Your car, if you have one, uses a fuel filter, an oil filter, an air filter. Do you get the message? Pure is useful. It's beneficial. And so God's word is pure. And that means it is useful, beneficial, life-imparting, health-giving, soul-restoring. Did you notice the contrast in the psalm between God's words on one hand and the words of sinful people on the other hand? They come in in the other order, actually. Verses 2 to 4 give us the words of sinful people. Let me read those. Verses 2 to 4. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. 
May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us. Who is master over us? And then see the contrast in verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. Now, so often the, the words of sinful humans, which we all are, aren't we? are very impure, our words, and the words of unbelievers are very impure. I heard that this evening, this afternoon. I heard someone ranting and blaspheming and cursing into his phone at full pelt walking along Paul Avenue. You don't need me to illustrate that such speech as is described in verses 2 to 4 is everywhere. I mean, it wouldn't be helpful if I did illustrate it, but I'm sure you don't need me to anyway. I'm sure you can think of many instances across the board in life where lies are prevalent. And as regards flattery, I think this is actually closer to home for Christians, actually. Flattery. I find it so anyway. It's easy to flatter people. It can feel loving and it makes us popular. But it's condemned here and elsewhere in the Bible not to, not to flatter. Do, you flat, I, do I flatter? It's worth asking the question and stopping ourselves when we do. The point is that these, these ways of speaking in, in verses 2 to 4 are not like God's ways. These ways of speaking in verses 2 to 4 are corrupt, they're impure, they're useless at best, but actually they're not. They're destructive, they're destructive, they're toxic. It's like putting sludge in your fuel tank or sewage on your toast. You just wouldn't do it, would you? It's revolting to think about it. There's a challenge here as to whether we watch what's corrupt and vile. And I don't just mean pornography. That, that, that is clearly vile and, and, and clearly it's something to, we should not touch. But actually other things as well to do with speech that we watch. Do we watch impure speech? Do we delight in those things? Do we delight in, you know, from our TVs and our phones and devices or whatever it is, do we, do we enjoy listening to people deceiving and speaking proudly and manipulating one another and those sorts of things? The words of the Lord, though, are pure words, like silver refined, purified seven times. So God is not a flatterer. He calls it straight. He's a, he tells us that we're sinners. God's not, God's not a smooth talker. He's not a conniver with his words. He's not a deceiver. He doesn't promise one thing and then fail to deliver. He doesn't say one thing and mean another. He does what he promises. He says what he means. He's a God of truth. He speaks truth. And so all of his words, which we have in our Bibles from beginning to end, are pure and trustworthy and true words. Now, can I just pick, on, pick up on the last phrase of, of verse 6? Do you see verse 6? It says that the words of the Lord are purified seven times. That is a Hebrew way of speaking, seven, to connote um, completeness. It means completely pure. God's word is completely pure. But can I just, bear with me, right? Can I just indulge in a bit of maths here? A bit of geeky maths. To feel the significance of this, that's the purpose, okay? Not just to be geeky, okay? If something is purified seven times, it doesn't make it seven times purer. It makes it exponentially purer to the power of seven. Let me illustrate. If I have a bottle with one millimeter of some impurity in it, and I rinse it once with 100 milliliters of water, it becomes one time purer, as it were. A hundred times purer. If I rinse that bottle twice with the same amount of water, it doesn't, become, it doesn't become twice 200 milliliters. Sorry, it doesn't become twice 200 times purer. It becomes 100 times 100 times purer. That's 10,000 times purer. So if something is purified seven times, let's say my bottle of one millimeter of impurity, and I'm using 100 milliliters of water to rinse it, if I purify that, water, that bottle seven times, then that is, it ends up being a hundred to the power of seven times purer. That's not seven hundred times purer, that's a hundred trillion times purer. If I've got my maths wrong, 
come and talk to me afterwards. But the point is this. Extremely pure is the point. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Extremely pure is what I'm t- saying. Now, of course, the word of God has no impurity in it to start with. In my illustration, I had one millimeter of impurity to start with, and then a hundred trillionth of it left at the end. The word of God has no impurity to start with. And so what do you do if you take something pure and purify it exponentially seven times, as it were? It, it is very, extremely pure, down to the last detail. The, the Bible is thoroughly, completely, utterly pure. Now, being, now, this is important. This is important doctrinally. I'm not just sort of going off on one here. It's important because people deny this. You see, being so thoroughly without impurity, God's word, the Bible, is inerrant, without error. Some people have been trying to distinguish between infallibility and inerrancy, saying the Bible is infallible, meaning reliable for all matters of faith and salvation, but they'll say it is errant. It errs in historical detail or maybe scientific something or other, I don't know but in things not particularly pertaining to salvation. And so they make this distinction. It, can that be true, given verse, given verse 6? Purified seven times. Can it possibly be true? It can't. It's impossible. Verse, seven, verse 6 sorry, knocks that down completely. It is impossible for God's word to be infallible but not inerrant. God's word is both infallible and inerrant. We need to hold on to that. We need to believe that confidently and see it affirmed here. It's utterly pure. God's word is utterly pure, of course, because it comes from an utterly pure source. God himself. It cannot be with error. Now, in this last section of the sermon, I want to bring these things together by showing you that the purity of God's word is not some abstract property. You see, you see, we could go home from this evening going, great, we thought about the purity of God's word this evening. That's very interesting. My mind is filled, but my heart is not. That's not how we want you to go home tonight. I want you to go home with a mind filled and a heart filled as well. Overflowing would be even better. So let me do that. Let me try that anyway with God's help. Because the purity you see of God's word is not some abstract or even less some dull property of God's word, that it's pure. It's, it's the delight of the believer. It is life to our souls. Why is that? How is that? Well, that's because it's, the, it's about the gospel. The purity of God's word, it, it speaks of the gospel. It speaks of the free promises of God to save the undeserving. Now, we get a hint of that in our psalm. Look at verse 6, and it says that the words of the Lord are pure words. And as it's saying that, David is referring to the previous verse, where he heard God speak to him in a very direct, prophetic way. Now, the, So the words of the Lord, verse 6 talks about, are, are in verse 5. And you see the last sentence of verse 5. Let me read that to you, but with a slight different translation. The Lord says this, I will place him in the salvation for which he longs. You see the word safety there in the ESV? That word, it's just the standard word for salvation. It could very easily be translated salvation. Um, and I don't see any reason why it isn't, personally. Um, but you see that now the situation here is, is a particular sort of salvation, um, maybe. But it, 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 it speaks of a bigger salvation, doesn't it? That's, that's what David's talking about when he says that the words of the Lord are pure. The words of the Lord about saving, they're, they are gloriously, resplendently, radiantly pure and helpful and beneficial and life-giving and health-imparting. So it's the good news of salvation by the undeserved mercy of God, held onto by faith. That is what David delights in, particularly as being God's pure word. Now, there's a word found in a a number of times in the pastoral epistles of the New Testament. We're going to leave Psalm 12 now and and move to our New Testaments in this last part of the sermon. The pastoral epistles are uh, the first and second letters to Timothy and Titus. Those are the three pastoral epistles. Um, So you might like to head towards there. 
um, sort of page 991, thereabouts. That's where they start in the Black Bibles. There's a word that comes up in the pastoral epistles. It's actually a word I hinted at earlier when, in that passage when we read Titus chapter 2. I said, Look, listen out for a particular word in the first part of the chapter. What was that word? It's the word sound. The word sound. Now, I think this comes from, I think this has, has come into the ES3 from um, older translations where it means healthy. And in fact, the original Greek word really means healthy. And so these pastoral, pastoral epistles, uh, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, they a number of times have this word coming up, and it comes up as sound doctrine or sound words or sound teaching. And so if we want to more literally understand it, it's healthy Doctrine, healthy words, healthy teaching. Now, can you see the connection to what our psalm talks about, the Lord's pure words? Hopefully you can see the connection there. Now, in the pastoral epistles, the apostle Paul contends strongly for sound doctrine to be upheld. That's that's a very key concern of his, for which he writes those letters. But it's not from any sense of just sort of, I don't know, glorying in what's right. That is not what Paul is about as he seeks to uphold sound doctrine. It's because sound doctrine and teaching are the pure words of eternal life and health that the believer delights in and glories in and drinks in. It's the glorious good news of free and full salvation that we just come into the inheritance of by believing. That's the healthy doctrine. That's the healthy words that Paul is so eager to uphold. And so what we find in the pastoral epistles is that when the apostle Paul mentions something like sound doctrine, or well, healthy, I'll use the word healthy, that's what it literally is. When he mentions healthy doctrine or something like that, we'll very often find that nearby that reference, there is a beautiful exposition of the healthy doctrine of the gospel, the life imparting, the delight giving the health-giving doctrine, the beautiful gospel. And so in my last few minutes, I'd just like to read some of these. And in actual fact, we're going to read for one from each of the pastoral epistles, an instance of this. We're going to see him mention sound or healthy something or other, and then we'll see an instance of that nearby. Hopefully that will be helpful for us. So 1 Timothy, we'll start there. 1 Timothy, page 991. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Am I allowed to have that open? Verse 10, first of all. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. In that verse, it mentions sound doctrine, you see, or if you actually follow the footnote, why don't you? Healthy, there it is. Healthy. Healthy doctrine. It mentions that there. And it goes on in verse 11 to describe that as the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. So already there we get a sense that the healthy doctrine is not some dry thing that you just sort of sign up to and leave it on a shelf. This is something that's a glory and this is something wonderful. And then we get a little nugget of this healthy doctrine in verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. In fact, let me read back, because that's a bit sad to start there, isn't it? Because given what comes before. Let me read back uh, verse 13 to 15. Paul says this, I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. You hear Paul there delighting in this gospel, delighting in these healthy words of God's grace to him. They're they're meat and food to his soul, aren't they? Meat and drink to his soul. Okay, let's look at 2 Timothy, chapter 1, page 995. And here in verse 13, 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 13, we see Paul speaking about the sound words, the healthy words. Verse 13, follow the pattern of healthy words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Well, he's already actually given an instance of these healthy words in the previous verses. So let me read verses 8 to 10 to get, give you a taster of them. Specifically verses 9 to 10, but we'll read from verse 8. 
Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. This grace is something that given before the creation of the world and not based on works, not, not according to how we've lived our lives. Let me pick it up. Who saved us and called us, verse 9, to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. There's the healthy words. There's the pure word of the Lord coming with all its beneficial helpfulness and usefulness and health-giving life impartingness. And then one more in Titus. Titus chapter 2. We looked at this chapter earlier. I won't read the whole chapter again. Titus chapter 2. We'll hear the word sound. Did you count them earlier? There were three times it comes. Verse 1, 2, and 8. Verse 1. As for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. That's Paul's urging to Titus. Verse 2. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, healthy in faith. What does that mean? That means saturated with the gospel. In love, in steadfastness. Verse 8. No, sorry, verse 6, 7 and 8. It's a whole sentence. Show yourselves, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech, healthy speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. So, having said this word healthy three times, we then nearby find an instance of these healthy words in the chunk I highlighted earlier, verses 11 to 14. I will read that, verses 11 to 14 of Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. If you want something for your quiet time tomorrow morning, those four verses would do very well. Do you see then how the pure words of God are words to delight in? They are words to leave all and seize hold of and gain an interest in. They're words of good news of the gospel. They're words of good news that more than offset the bad news and the vileness that we live around and hear constantly about all the time. Here in this healthy doctrine of the gospel is free grace to sinners, free pardon, free salvation from hell, free eternal life in Christ for those who repent from their sin and trust in Christ. Maybe there are some this evening who've never come to Christ as a sinner to the Savior. If that's the case, then the pure, health-giving, life-imparting words of eternal life of the gospel are for you to receive and believe in. Even here this evening, repent and believe, and Christ will receive you for eternal life. Those are the healthy promises of the gospel. And for those who are already believers, my application, which which you've heard me say many times before, but I think it's key, and I'll say it again. It's to feed on these pure words daily. It's to drink them in. It's to relish them. It's to build yourself up on them. I mean, if you were a bodybuilder, you'd be eating something pretty healthy and nourishing and muscle building or whatever it is. I'm not into that, clearly. So this is what, this is the spiritual equivalent of that. Drink daily that what Peter calls the pure spiritual milk of the gospel, the word of God and the, the salvation that's found in it. Keep away from what is vile. That is an important thing to take from this evening. Keep away from what's vile. See it for what it is and flush it away. That's what we do with what's vile, don't we? We flush it down the loo. So we should do with the vile things that we can so easily get entangled in that come to our screens. Nourish your soul rather on the things of Christ. The things that Paul in Philippians 4.8 calls true, 
honourable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. On these things we need to meditate and feed ourselves. Amen. Let's pray.